Alright, so welcome back. This is going to be screencast number two for chapter 17 and in this screencast we are going to continue our discussion on the annelids or the segmented worms and in this screencast we're going to focus primarily on the class Oligochaeta, and that's going to include the earthworms um, that a lot of us are familiar with. Now, when you look at this class, we're going to be looking at a group of worms that has a very special reproductive structure called the clitellum. And the clitellum is going to be pretty obvious most of the time when you look at an earthworm. It's going to be rather obvious because it looks like a rather large kind of um, um, engorged segment on the worm itself. And if you look at this diagram right here, you can see the clitellum um, pointed out right here. And if you look down here in this particular um, example, we're going to notice we have actually two earthworms that are very, very close together. And you can see the clitellum on both of these worms. And so the clitellum is right here and right here. Now the worms that I had you guys looking at in class, it looked like they weren't quite in the reproductive mood. So their clitellums weren't quite as obvious as the ones that you see right here. Now this clitellum is a ring of secretory cells that are going to be found in a band around the body. So when it says secretory cells, we're talking about cells that actually are going to secrete usually a mucousy type of substance that's going to work to actually contain um, the eggs that are going to be produced by this worm. Now, they're permanent in this particular class, but visible only during the reproductive season and leeches. So leeches do have this clitellum, but most of the time when you look at a leech, you're not going to be able to see them. Now, these particular um, worms do lack parapodia. So if you remember back when we looked at the polychaetes, the polychaetes, the parapodia, were very obvious structures on that animal. But if you look at the earthworm, they do not have the parapodia. Now, as these worms are considered monoecious, they are considered hermaphroditic, which means they actually have both male and female reproductive parts in the same animal. Um, they do exhibit what we call direct development, which means that the young that are produced by this animal look pretty much like the adults. Now, the young do develop inside of a cocoon, and again, that cocoon is going to be secreted by that clitellum, which makes these um, worms kind of unique. And as I said, they do practice direct development, so they do emerge as small worms. Now, as I had said in this second screencast, we're going to focus primarily on the class Oligochaeta, and that's the one that actually contains the earthworms. Now, there's about 3,000 species that belong to this class. They can occur in habitats from terrestrial or soil dwelling um, oligochaetes to um, actually freshwater worms as well. And there are a few marine species or parasitic species that are out there. Um, in fact, on the right hand side here, you can see this is an example of a a marine type of oligochaete, and this is actually another example of a marine oligochaete. But of course, the one that we're very familiar with is the earthworms that you see right down here. Now, nearly all of the members in this particular class do bear the CT, or those very tiny, tiny bristles that you guys looked at in the polychaetes, and actually some of you have already looked at in the earthworms. Um, but again, they're very few in number when you compare them to the polychaetes, the class that we had talked about previously. Now, in terms of form and function, sometimes we call these worms night crawlers, and so these worms do tend to come out when it's rather cool, and um, they're not very fond of the light, so they don't like to, to be in direct sunlight. So oftentimes you're going to find these at night. Now they do burrow into the moist rich soil. Um, the soil typically is again very wet, it's usually very loose, and they usually live in what we consider a sort of a branched interconnected type of tunnel system underground. Now, as we had said, there's lots of different varieties when it comes down to this particular class of annelids, but we're going to focus primarily on the earthworms because that's the one that most of us are very familiar with. Now, even though we had said that they do tend to inhabit rather moist, um, kind of loose soils, um, the soil needs to be damp, but it can't be really wet. Um, when you think about these worms in rainy weather, they oftentimes will actually make their way to the surface. Now the reason for this is because they actually do respire through their skin. And so if those interconnected tunnels that they inhabit actually fill up with water, they need to make sure they make it to the surface so they can breathe. Now if you have conditions that are super dry, these animals are actually going to burrow as deep underground as they can. And if it's really dry, if it's exceedingly dry, they might even go dormant. And what they're going to do is they're actually going to secrete a slime and actually stay within that slime chamber for a period of time until the weather improves. Now, these particular animals have what we call peristaltic 
movements. Now what that means is that they actually have contractions of both circular and longitudinal muscles in the body of the animal. Now when you think about both kinds of muscles, each type of muscle actually performs a different function in the animal's body. When you look at the circular muscles that are found in this worm, those circular muscles are going to act to actually lengthen the body. So it's kind of like taking a, a balloon and kind of squeezing it. And so what's going to happen is those muscles are going to contract and squeeze that worm and actually push the anterior end forward and that anterior end can then anchor to the substrate that it happens to be on at the time. So the circular muscles are going to squeeze and actually lengthen the worm. Now when it anchors, it's going to anchor by the contraction of the longitudinal muscles in the forward segments. And so what we have is those longitudinal muscles, which are actually going to run the length of the animal, those are going to contract, which means that the actually causes the animal then to actually kind of fatten up or widen up. And when it does that, it's actually going to push against the burrow. So what you're going to have is you're going to have a worm that's actually braced against the side. And of course, those very tiny bristles that are found on the worm, those CT, are going to act to actually anchor that worm into the, um, the tunnel that it happens to be in. And that's one of the reasons why it's really difficult to actually pull a worm out of its burrow. As I had said, one thing that's really unique about these um, worms is that they have those special structures called CT. And we had looked at the CT in the polychaetes. Now remember the CT are those very tiny, tiny bristles that you see over here on the right-hand side that sort of extend from the, um, the side of the worm or maybe the ventral part of the worm as you would see in the earthworms. So it says the CT are bristle-like -like rods that are set in a sack and actually moved by very tiny muscles. And so you can see here we have what we call retractor muscles. So retract, of course, means to pull in. And we have protractor muscles means to sort of push out. And so these muscles act to sort of position those CT in various aspects as the animal moves through the environment. So they're going to project outward through those small pores in the cuticle and actually aid in anchoring, as we had said before, by digging into the walls of the burrow as that worm expands and contracts. Now when you talk about the nutrition for these particular groups of worms, um, most of these worms are going to be considered scavengers. Now if you're a scavenger, you're going to go out and basically feed on decayed organic matter, maybe leaves, any type of refuse that happens to be out there, etc. Now the food itself is going to be moistened by the mouth and it's going to be drawn in by the sucking action of a very muscular pharynx. And you can see the pharynx right here in this example of the earthworm. Now the food is going to be stored in a thin walled crop and you can see the crop right here and you guys will be able to see that when you dissect into your um, earthworm. And after the crop you're going to have a structure called the gizzard. Now the gizzard is pretty unique because what it's going to do is it's going to act actually to grind the food into super small pieces. And once it's small enough all the digestion is going to occur and absorption in the intestine of the worm. Now when discussing circulation and respiration in these worms, you're going to find that the salemic fluid and blood actually transports the food, the waste, and the respiratory gases throughout the worm. So the blood is going to circulate in what we consider a closed system. Now I want you to think back when we had talked about the mollusks and we actually had two different types of systems we had looked at there. We had an open circulatory system where there were going to be very few blood vessels and the blood was simply going to pool and basically surround the um, visceral mass or the organs of that animal. Then like we had in the squid, we had what we call a closed system, which means we have a pretty defined heart and all of the blood is going to be contained within those vessels. So the blood in this case is going to circulate through a closed system with five main trunks running lengthwise in the body. And you're going to be able to see this again when you dissect into your, your worm. Now the dorsal blood vessel, which is going to be the blood vessels that you find on top of the worm. And if you look at the example right over here, you're going to notice that they have the dorsal blood vessel itself actually running right through here. All right, so this is going to be considered the dorsal blood vessel. Um, this is going to actually contain valves that actually function as what we consider a true heart. Now this is going to pump blood anteriorly into five pairs of aortic arches. And sometimes those five pairs of aortic arches um, will be referred to as the five hearts that you would find within the earthworm. And so those aortic arches that you see right over here, as I had said, 
would be considered the pumping structures for this animal. And so they're going to ensure a very steady pressure in the ventral blood vessel. Again, it's going to run along the ventral or bottom part of the animal. And you can see this ventral vessel right through here. Now the ventral vessel, as we had said, is going to serve as an aorta and it's going to deliver blood to the body walls, to the nephridia, which are um, excretory structures, and also to the digestive tract in the worm. Now the blood will contain colorless amoeboid cells, and if they're going to be amoeboid cells, remember that word right here um, refers to cells that actually could move throughout the blood in this animal, and it's also going to contain the dissolved hemoglobin. And when you talk about hemoglobin, you're talking about a structure that actually will um, actually collect or hold on to the oxygen found um, within the animal and actually transport it to different parts of the body. Now there's really no special um, gas exchange organs in this animal. Now what that means is that they don't have gills and they don't have lungs. All of the gas exchange that um, this animal actually carries out is going to occur across the body surface. So what that means is they actually breathe through their skin. Now when we talk about excretion, um, we're talking about the removal of waste from this worm. So remember, we're talking about worms that are metameric, which means that they are made up of lots of individual segments that have pretty much each segment containing all of the major organs that you would find within that animal, and that does include the excretory organs as well. So each segment is going to have a pair of metanephridia, which is going to be the excretory organ. So every segment except for the first three and the terminal one will have this structure. Now, a ciliated funnel, the nephrostome, is going to draw in waste and actually lead through the septum. So again, the septum is going to be those um, very thin tissue areas that you find that actually would separate each of the segments. And that ciliated funnel, that nephrostome, which is right here, is going to carry the waste from each segment to those nef nephridia or metanephridia. And again, those metanephridia are going to act to absorb that waste. So these are going to coil until the nephridia duct actually ends at a bladder. And so this very thick structure that you see right through here is the bladder of the animal. So all of that waste material that's actually being taken in through this um, funnel that you see right here, or even through the blood vessels, the capillary network that actually surrounds these nephridia, are going to collect within this bladder. And so that's going to empty out actually through the nephridia pore of the animal. So each segment will have this very special pore. So the waste from both the coelom and the blood capillary beds are going to be discharged or taken out through that special structure. So compared to a lot of the animals that we've looked at in previous phyla, this is going to be one of the first times that you can actually locate um, a pretty well-defined nervous system. So the central nervous system and peripheral nerves that you would find in this animal, again, are going to be pretty easy to see. They have a pair of cerebral ganglia that are going to connect around the pharynx to the ganglia of the ventral nerve cord. So what you notice here over here on the right is that we have a ventral nerve cord that's running along the bottom of the animal. And again, when you dissect your worm, you're going to be able to see this and locate this. The cerebral ganglia, again, it's going to be pretty easy to, to locate. This is considered the brain of the animal. Then, of course, we have these lateral nerves, as it said over here on the left, that actually are going to wrap around the pharynx of that animal. So if you notice over here, it says the fused ganglia in each segment actually contains both sensory and motor fibers. And so, of course, these um, ganglia are going to be used to sense various stimuli in the environment and, of course, to instruct various parts of the animal in doing the tasks that are necessary to make sure that this animal can, for example, move throughout its environment and perform various tasks to be able to keep this animal alive. Now, they do have neurosecretory cells in the brain and ganglia that are going to secrete neurohormones. And so what we have here is we have hormones being produced that are going to be very important in regulating reproduction, secondary sex characteristics, for example, the development of that clitellum, and of course regeneration if that becomes necessary in these worms. Now these worms do lack eyes, but they do have many photoreceptors in the epidermis. Now what that means is that they're photoreceptors, they have the ability to um, take in or pick up light that's in the environment. Now the free nerve endings in the tegument, now the tegument is going to be akin to the skin 
of the worm. And these are probably tactile structures. In other words, what they do is these nerve endings act to sort of feel out the environment. So when you think about the general behavior in these worms, these animals actually practice negative phototaxis. Because remember, they actually lack eyes, but they do have photoreceptors in the epidermis. Now it's negative because instead of going towards the light, they actually avoid bright light. And so that's what they mean by negative phototaxis. Now these animals actually do a really good job at actually picking up various chemical stimuli in the environment. And this is really important because these animals have to have a way to be able to locate food in the environment. So even though they are scavengers, um, they are kind of selective in what they will actually take in as food. Now in regards to reproduction and development, as we had said earlier in the screencast, these animals are considered monoecious, which means that they actually have both male and female reproductive structures in the same animal. Now remember, the other word that we often use for this is going to be hermaphroditic. Now reproductive structures are going to be located in somites. Now remember the word somite is going to refer to segment 9 through 15 in most cases when you refer to these animals. Now sperm is going to be produced by the testes, obviously, and this sperm is going to mature in seminal vesicles and actually pass into special sperm ducts. Now the eggs are going to be discharged by the ovaries into the selenic cavity and the ciliated funnel is going to work to actually transport them to the outside. Now two pairs of seminal receptacles are going to act to receive and actually store the sperm. So if you look over here on the right, and I know it's kind of difficult to see, but you can actually see the sperm exchange is actually occurring in these earthworms. Now even though they are considered monoecious and they do have both sets of reproductive structures, these worms actually do mate, which means they do actually exchange gametes between worms. And so up here on the Right again, you can see the um, testes, which are going to be located very close to the ovaries. And again, these um, testes are going to secrete the sperm, which is going to mature in those seminal vesicles. And they're going to pass out through special sperm ducts. Now remember, the seminal receptacle is going to be the place where the sperm is actually received um, from the other worm. So when that exchange takes place, of course, we're going to have fertilization of those eggs occur. And as we had said, that clitellum, which is going to act as sort of a mucus producing um, reproductive structure, is actually going to secrete the egg sac. And of course, when those eggs are produced, that sac is going to move along the segments of the worm and eventually be released by that worm. So that sac is going to contain anywhere from four to maybe 10 fertilized eggs. And it's going to be, of course, the cocoon that you would find in the environment produced by these worms. Now reproductively, these worms are going to tend to mate at night, usually during very warm, moist weather. Now what they're going to do is they're going to align in opposite directions and they're going to have their ventral surfaces held very close together because that's where you're going to find those reproductive pores. Now there's going to be a mucus that's going to be secreted by the clitellum and that's going to be used to help to hold the worms together during the reproductive process. Now sperm from each of the worms is going to be transported to the seminal receptacles and these receptacles again are going to act to receive the sperm of the other worm and they're going to travel along the seminal grooves as they actually make their way to these receptacles. Now after mutual copulation or mutual mating, each worm is going to secrete a mucus tube and that mucus tube is going to be secreted by that clitellum and it's going to be a chitinous band which is going to be used to help form that cocoon and that cocoon is going to be used to help hold the eggs. Now again as it passes forward the eggs, the albumin, and the sperm are going to be added. So the eggs and the sperm are going to come together so fertilization can actually occur and that albumin is going to be used to help to feed um, the young as they grow within those eggs. Then of course after a period of time, and it can be anywhere depending on the environment itself, for maybe two, three, four weeks, the young worms are going to emerge from the cocoon. Now remember, those young worms are going to be very similar in appearance to the adult worms because these worms practice direct development. All right, so that's going to finish up our second screencast for Chapter 17. As always, please make sure that you have completed your screencast study guide before you come to class.